So moving on then to uh, Gene Gebser's ever-present origin, uh, I want to move into a discussion now of that chapter by chapter. We've gone through Spangler, and I think that um, Gebser's work really constitutes, in, in Toynbee's sense, it constitutes a response uh, to the challenge set up by Spengler's decline of the West, which had pictured uh, Western civilization falling apart in the middle of the 19th century as it moves in t from a culture to a civilization phase at just the time that Gebser sees this period as the mutation of a new consciousness structure, which he will call in this the integral slash a perspectival consciousness structure. Um, and this will be his response. And you can sort of see the ghost of Spengler in the way that the book is organized, it too, like Spangler's Decline of the West, was put out in two volumes. Volume 1 of this book came out in 1949, Volume 2 in 1953, and it too, like Decline of the West, has all these charts, uh, these big long charts in the back of the book uh, that map out his uh, consciousness structures the same way that there are charts in the back of Spangler's book mapping out the different consciousness structures of the different civilizations. Um, Gebser uh, was born in 1905, a little bit of background material, in Posen, and he was educated in Königsberg, the old city of Kant, where Immanuel Kant lived. Uh, in 1931, uh, he left Germany for Spain, lived in Spain where he befriended uh, Garcia Lorca, uh, lived there for a while, and then when the Spanish Civil War happened in 1936, he left his apartment just 12 hours before it was bombed by the Nazis, uh, so that was good timing. And then he went to Paris and hung out with Picasso and André Malraux in Paris, uh, and then eventually uh, crossed over into Switzerland, where he wrote this book, uh, in, uh, published it in 1949. He says that the idea for the book came to him in 1932, so it had been germinating in his mind for a while by the time he sat down to write it. Um, and he died in 1973. He didn't... Uh, Unlike Spengler, who had higher degrees, he did have a PhD, but or the German equivalent of that, but chose to teach at a high school level uh, because he didn't like academia or academics. Uh, Gebser, too, I think, was allergic to academics. He didn't even have higher degrees uh, and just got by the best that he could, bouncing from job to job. And by the time he was offered a professorship uh, at a chair in, uh, for the study of comparative civilizations, at the University of Salzburg, he was already too sick with asthma from smoking, from a lifelong habit of smoking, to accept the chair, uh, and so he died in 1973. Uh, but this book is a considerable work that he has left behind, and I want to move right now into a discussion of it. Part one is called Foundations of the Aperspectable World, a Contribution to the History of the Awakening of Consciousness. So we're going to get this idea that um, throughout history, certain consciousness structures have come into being as mutations, and they have a very definite uh, anatomies to them. Uh, each one of these consciousness structures is like a different organism with its own anatomy, its own internal characteristics, uh, within which the human consciousness is embedded. Throughout history, these consciousness structures have uh, awoken more and more and come closer and closer to the light of day, as it were, until with Western civilization it has come to a point of, of utter sober clarity that now Gebser believes has passed its noon and is no longer that kind of sober, rational clarity that the West invented is no longer useful or, or has outlived its usefulness and is now needs to be uh, transcended by a new consciousness structure which he sees coming in in the middle of the 19th century which represents a new mutation, the integral consciousness structure. So, um, what he actually will do in terms of these consciousness structures, I don't want to go into the consciousness structures just yet, except insofar as to say that we have the archaic consciousness structure, which is then followed by the magical consciousness, the mythical consciousness, the rational consciousness, and then the, the integral, a perspectival consciousness. Uh, the magical consciousness structure, basically, he has taken from the Upanishads, the analysis in the Upanishads of the three different levels of consciousness, uh, deep, dreamless sleep, dreaming consciousness, and waking consciousness, and he's pictured the evolution of human consciousness through history as similar to this gradual waking cycle that we go through every day, such that the magical consciousness structure corresponds to the realm of deep, dreamless sleep. As we'll see, these are the causal zones from out of which everything arises, in which subject-object distinctions are dissolved and merged, 
and the world is experienced as a gigantic point-like unity in which everything is interconnected with everything else. In deep dreamless sleep, uh, there's pure future. Uh, it is oriented toward the future, not the present or the past. Then as we move into dreaming consciousness, uh, we begin to get subject-object differentiations in this myth-like world of subtle matter that we inhabit. So too in human history we, we move from the magical to the mythical consciousness structure in which we begin to get a differentiation of subject and object insofar as the micro-soul of the human being differentiates itself from the macro-soul of the macrocosm and we begin to get the world not point like unity but structured in terms of a polaristic yin-yang opposition of gigantic cosmic forces of good and evil, light and darkness, night and day, uh, the god of the sky versus the goddess of the earth in opposition to each other. And so that corresponds to the level of a dreaming consciousness, which is the level of the present, since your dreams refer to present potentialities within you. Then we move into waking consciousness, which always refers to the past, since waking consciousness is always slow to catch up to phenomena and understand them. Everything has already happened by the time the conscious mind comes along to begin to analyze it and understand it. Likewise, we move from the mythical consciousness structure into the rational consciousness structure, into the light of day, in which we get the sense of, of a subject, very strong subject-object distinction, uh, in which the world seems to operate in accordance with the principle of causality, whereas Spengler had made this opposition between uh, Dasein and Voxein, Dasein referring to these deeper levels of deep dreamless sleep and the instinctual levels uh, of uh, the causal zones that move the cosmos in a blind dreamlike being-like way versus Voxein, uh, the realm of waking consciousness in which a microcosm awakens to the light of day and perceives itself as separate from the macrocosm. This is what we have. On a daily basis we experience this as we wake up from our dreams and for gaps, our human civilization has experienced this as it has moved into the light of day with first the Greeks, then the Northern Europeans. So we see that he has borrowed this model from the Upanishads of the microcosm and expanded it to a macrocosmic vision of the slow, gradual awakening of consciousness throughout human history. Um, so that's the upshot of what he's going to say. And we'll see how the integral consciousness structure has very distinct characteristics that, are, uh, that involve not just a negation of the rationalism of the rational consciousness structure, but uh, a relativization of it, a taking up of it and a using it, but putting it in its place so that it doesn't have a kind of imperialistic uh, dictatorship uh, to the rest of the world. Uh, he's similar to Heidegger in, in this sense, in, in the relativization of this this consciousness uh, structure. So the opening chapter is a short one. It's called Fundamental Considerations. And the first thing he does here is he approaches the phenomena from the viewpoint of uh, perspectivity. He says, um, long about 1500, uh, about the time of Leonardo, the West underwent a fundamental mutation of consciousness with the advent of the perspectival structure. Uh, this will turn out actually to be the late or secondary phase of the rational consciousness structure that had already been discovered by the Greeks circa 5th century, 700 BC, let's say. But this is its late phase, and it's a new kind of consciousness structure uh, that appears and was worked out by the Italians in Italian art in the 15th century. And it, it's first fully mastered, he says, by Leonardo da Vinci, in which the world is laid out in terms of a subject-object distinction and the realm of objects is in a rationalistic, visually connected space in which objects, the qualities of objects, are determined by the subject's apprehension of those objects. And he says that uh, this, by perspectival, he does not just mean the arts. He doesn't mean that just uh, the, the invention of depth perspective in painting. That is itself one area of manifestation of a larger consciousness structure that was coming into being at that point, which includes the sciences. He says, for example, that without perspective, you can't do technical drawing, the kinds of uh, drawing of blueprints that enable machines to be possible. So it applies just as well for the sciences. And he means this for all of these consciousness structures, not just, uh, it's, this isn't just an art history thing. Uh, it, it includes every aspect of the civilization in a totalistic way. Um, so the perspectival consciousness structure comes in there. And before that, he says, we have a consciousness, we have the unperspectival consciousness of human history before that, and then after it we have the aperspectival consciousness, which we can begin to see coming into being in modern art, um, 
starting with the paintings of Manet, really. Manet is the sort of John the Baptist who uh, announces the coming of the breaking up of a c correct perspective in painting. You can see it especially in his painting, uh, Le Déjeuner sur l'herbe, where uh, Luncheon on the Grass, where you can see uh, the woman in the background, if she were perspectively correct, should be a nine foot tall giant. She's way out of perspective with the people on the grass in the foreground. So we can already see it beginning to disintegrate in Manet, and then of course the Impressionists just dissolve it. Cezanne is the classic exemplar, the first great master of this new kind of aperspectable sense of space and time, in which in fact time is integrated into the realm of space uh, in a holistic way. So um, in the history of Western art, you can see that there are a couple of epochs in which the arts undergo a complete transformation, 1870 and 1500. There's a massive transformation in 1500. Um, the world up to 1500, what he calls everything up till that point was unperspectable, was bounded in, in a kind of enclosed cavern-like universe. Now, we had seen with Spangler that he had said that the Magian civilization's primary Ur symbol was the cavern, the enclosed vision of a magical cavern in which the magical fairy tale like forces of light and darkness battled each other for possession of the human soul, whereas uh, the sense of space for the Greeks was um, each individual bodily thing, such that the Greek sense of space is purely figure minus ground. But Gebser's going to say that. <clears throat> The, both the, the Arabian Magian civilization as well as the Greek civilization can equally be regarded as enclosed inside of a cave, a cavern-like universe. Since if we look at uh, Greek cosmology, we have this idea of the Earth being at the center of the universe in ca encased in a series of concentric spheres which nicely enclose it and give it a cozy little womb-like feeling, what Peter Sloterdijk calls a macrosphere that immunologically acts to protect uh, hu the human psyche from the anxiety that results from the impacts and traumatic uh, experience of the real that happens, in fact, when Copernicus comes along in 1543, about a century after the, the discovery of depth perspective in painting, and demolishes this cave, this cavern cosmos, for the first time by setting the Earth into orbit around the sun and the spheres disintegrate. What happens in painting, and you can see the results of this, is that the history of medieval art is uh, really, when you look at all this artwork, you can see the sense that uh, the Western mind is encased in a world, uh, a closed cave-like universe in which everything happens in accordance with the magic of biblical forces, saints and angels and miracles, all these Christian iconotypes. When a medieval man looked out on the world, what he saw was a world in terms of Christian iconotypes. The adoration, the assumption of Mary to heaven, the crucifixion, the last, uh, the last judgment, the last supper. All of these things were standard iconotypes, and they were the world that he saw when he looked out. It was a protected world, a reassuringly enclosed world that protected and immunized Western man with the power of these Christian myths. Uh, when the spheres collapsed, uh, as they start collapsing, as depth perspective comes in, uh, although the iconotypes are still there, all the way through Leonardo and Raphael, even through Titian, until by the time of the 17th century, after Copernicus has dealt the death blow that demolishes the cave once and for all, what happens then is visible in the art, in Dutch art, in particular in the 17th century, in which suddenly you can see in Dutch art with its massive expansion of the heavens, uh, and th th suddenly the background becomes the main thing in Dutch art, the sky. They really are the first to discover the sky in, in a startling way. You really get the sense now that the spheres are gone and Western, all the existentialist crises that are going to unfold through the history of Western philosophy are just about to happen now because Western man is no longer immunized against the traumatic impacts of infinity what Spangler called infinite space, and what Gebser is calling here the perspectival consciousness structure. So we can see this process happening, and it's a trauma that happens there, and Western, you can see that subsequent history of Western philosophy as an attempt to build immunological systems to defend the human mind against now this new experience of being out naked, unexposed in infinite space, with nothing protecting him anymore. 
Uh, the death of God is, is the ultimate outcome of this. You can see it happen. So as Peter Sloterdijk says, and, and Sloterdijk's works, for anyone who likes either Sloterdijk or Gebser, you, you really should read both of them because they, uh, they cross-fertilize each other's ideas. And I don't think Sloterdijk ever read Gebser. But for, for Sloterdijk, uh, every time a, a macrosphere collapses in a civilization, it leads to an ontological crisis and a whole new set of anxieties come in.